Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Monterey's Magical History Tour with historian Tim Thomas. I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, today's event, um, Tim will be talking about sardines go to war. A uh, couple housekeeping. Um, we do ask that everyone put yourself on mute um, while Tim is presenting. Um, if you do have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat and I'll be monitoring that. Or we'll have some time at the end for some question and answering. And thank you all. And Tim, it's all yours. Thank you, Sean, and welcome everyone. Uh, today's kind of a special day for a couple of different reasons. Um, yes, we are my regular monthly uh, program, uh, Monterey's Magical History Tour, but it's also the first day of our Cannery, Do Cannery Row Days Hoop Dee Doodle. This is actually the third annual Cannery Row Days. Uh, and remember, remember from last year, we, uh, we went on um, for a couple of months and we focused on the book Cannery Row. And this year we are focusing on the book Sweet Thursday, which actually is my favorite of all of John Steinbeck's books. I love Sweet Thursday. Uh, and Sweet Thursday is kind of a sequel uh, to Cannery Row. He actually wrote it, as I understand it, as a tribute to his uh, best friend, Ed Ricketts, who had killed a couple of years before that, actually in 1948. And it takes place after the collapse of the sardine fishery. And so we thought maybe it'd be fun to sort of talk about the sardine fishery and really what drove that sardine fishery. And, and it really was kind of the wars that drew the, that really drove the sardine fishery. So we're gonna talk about that today. But I also uh, want to uh, mention a couple of things. One, uh, I, I, uh, we're actually, uh, this, today's show is sort of a tribute to my friend Jerry Lo Sabato, who some of you may have known or heard that name. Jerry was passed away last week, actually. She was 71, so far too young. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit later at the end of the program, but this whole program today is, is dedicated to Jerry. I think she would appreciate that. So uh, with that, we're going to start the program. As I mentioned, we're Sweet Thursday. And if you haven't read Sweet Thursday, um, I highly recommend it. It's really a wonderful little book. Uh, it's easy to read. Uh, and over the next couple of months, every Thursday, we have a variety of different programs that will focus on different parts of the book, Sweet Thursday. Uh, and including at the end, we're going to, because uh, many of you know that uh, Steinbeck actually wrote this book with the idea to be turned into a Broadway musical. And there was a Broadway musical called Pipe Dream uh, that came out of the book. And it wasn't a big hit, but uh, it was written by Robert Rogers and Hammerstone. He actually wrote all the music. And uh, at the end of the last program in, in November, we're going to have a sort of musical tribute to Pipe Dream. We'll have some actors who will be singing some of the songs and actors talking about the musical, all kinds of cool stuff. All right, so we're going to get into our little program here. Sardines go to war. And so here's our sardine. Uh, that's the California sardine or the pilchard. Truth is that uh, sardines are kind of a generic word in some way. As almost every small silvery fish referred to as a sardine. And what they catch in California along the West Coast here is the pilchard or this guy. And these guys are actually kind of big. And what most people don't know is that at the, around the turn of the 20th century, really into the 19 teens and early 20s, Sardines were something that people ate in the United States almost on a daily basis, almost kind of like we eat potato chips or crackers today. Sardines were a very popular food item, but the sardines that people were eating were not these big guys, but were these little guys, these guys right here, these guys that came out of the North Atlantic or came from Europe. At the turn of the 20th century, um, France was the big sardine producer uh, at that time. Uh, so French sardines were very, very popular in the United States at that time. Uh, but the Monterey sardine, you know, the California sardine, this guy right here, which eventually becomes the largest fishery of a single fish in the history of the United States, uh, all for a fish that people didn't really want to eat. Uh, uh, and we're going to get to why that is eventually. Uh, but what people really wanted was this little guy uh, you see right here. So, but it really didn't start with sardines. It starts with this guy right here. It starts with salmon. Salmon was the big fishery, not just in Monterey, but was in California at the turn of the 20th century, uh, mainly because of, uh, uh, of technology. 
at the at the turn in the mid 1890s, the big salmon fishery in California it was actually happening up along the Sacramento River. Uh, at that time, there weren't catching a lot of salmon. There were some uh, there were some ecological view issues going on at that time. Uh, there was the depression in the country going on at that time, and so all the processors sort of formed this co-op called the Sacramento River. Sacramento River Packers Association and try to figure out what was going on. And they heard of these big landings of salmon going on in Monterey. And that was happening for a couple of reasons. One was technology. Uh, one of them was the introduction of fishing salmon with a rod and reel. Uh, prior to that, they used to fish salmon with hand lines, which is very difficult. Had, you know, but they, uh, this was introduced uh, into Monterey in the mid 1890s. Uh, by a guy named Jay Parker Whitney, who was a sport fisherman. He was a wealthy sport fisherman who made a lot of money actually raising sheep. And he used to, back, by the time he was 30, he was so wealthy that he just spent the rest of his life traveling the world doing the things that he loved, which was hunting and fishing. And he spent a lot of time in Monterey, staying at the Hotel Del Monte, fishing salmon out in the bay out there. This is this is not Mr. Whitney, but this is a Monterey commercial fisherman. And he would hire these commercial fishermen to take them out on their boat and act as fishing guides to show them the good place to fish for salmon out in the bay out there. And these Monterey commercial fishermen uh, noticed this idea of fishing them with this rod and reel. Which they're also using trolling lines, which is a line with a lot of hooks on it. You drag through the water as the boat is moving, which is a really effective way to catch salmon so these Monterey commercial fishermen said, well, wait a minute, I think we can do that. And I have salmon landing records to go back to that time and you can see it. In 1893, they caught 5,000 pounds worth of salmon and they switched this new trolling technology using these, these rod and reels and they caught almost, in 1895, they caught almost uh, 95,000 pounds worth of salmon out of the Monterey Bay, which gets the attention of our friend, Mr. Booth, who come down to Monterey. And around the same time, there was a, a group of arriving Japanese fishermen who also brought technology with them. And they were the primary salmon fishermen out on the bay out there. So Booth came to Monterey and goes, oh man, this is fantastic. He tried to get contracts with these Japanese fishermen. And they said, no, no, we, we got good contracts to markets in San Francisco. So Mr. Booth backs off a little bit builds a little shed up near the Monterey Wharf. And in between that time, the city of Monterey leases a piece of property just adjacent to the wharf to a man named H.R. Robbins. And I have seen Mr. Robbins' lease. It says on his lease, for the purposes of a sardine cannery, a reduction plant, a dance hall. He also sold sea lions to the circuses. Needless to say that Mr. Robbins was not the greatest businessman, and Booth bought him out in 1903, and got the contracts of Japanese fishermen, and began to experiment with those large sardines that are appearing in the bay at the end of the salmon season. This is a really early, in fact, this is probably the first label for Monterey sardines. This is from 1903, when Booth took over that cannery and began to can sardines in Monterey. As a small secondary fishery, salmon was still a big fishery for him. This is just secondary stuff right here. I love this label. You can see, I don't know, we've got palm trees. And it's like we're out in the desert here somewhere, but that's what he was using to, to, to market his Monterey sardine because they weren't all that popular, uh, but because he was making his money in the salmon business out there. Uh, here is an ad that appeared in 1905 in a Sears and Roebuck catalog. Uh, this is probably the first national ad for Monterey sardines. Let's see if we can do a close up here. You can see right here. It was advertised in here as soused, those are pickling spices, broiled mackerel. He's selling these Monterey sardines as Monterey mackerel. But even in 1905, because he thought they were too big, no one's going to buy those as sardines. But even in 1905, the Monterey, uh, or the federal government said, no, 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 you cannot call those sardines, those, or cannot call those mackerel. They're not mackerel, those are sardines. So they marketed these fish initially to the African American communities as salmon sardines, and they marketed them to the Jewish communities as herring sardines. They tried a variety of things to sell this fish. Oop, I need to 
they would put, this is another ad that they would put out, try to sell this fish. This is uh, up to the, uh, 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 this new food lends desired variety to your Lenten menus. So they're selling us to the, to the, mainly to the Catholic community here. The delicious food is known as Effie Booth food sardines, dinner size, because they were so big. They were still trying to find all kinds of things to market this fish. But the truth is, the real money was really in the salmon business. And what was all that salmon? What was he doing with it? Well, there really wasn't a market for it in the United States. The big market actually was the big market for it actually was in Europe. 90% of that, uh, that salmon market was going to Europe, mostly to Germany. That's where it was all going to. Uh, not They were sort of pickling it and they shipped it that way uh, to Europe. Well, he needed a starting fisherman at this point to fish this secondary fisher for him because most of the Japanese fishermen were leaving Monterey at the end of that salmon season to go work in the agricultural fields in the Central Valley of California, only to return in the spring to fish salmon. And I'm sure you guys are all aware at the turn of the 20th century, there was a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment in the United States coming primarily from white workers who were convinced the Japanese were coming to take their job, which really wasn't the case. But in 1905, Mr. Booth said to the local newspaper, I'm not going to hire any more Japanese, which was an easy call for him because he didn't really mean it. He was still going to buy salmon from them when they turned to the front in the spring. But it was that instant, he sent for the Sicilian fishermen who already worked for him up along the Sacramento River, fishing salmon, come down here to Monterey to start fishing sardine here, the small secondary fishery. All those sardines, where were they going? They're the ones he, whoop, the ones he could sell. Uh, to a uh, local market and to the United States market, but they, again, they, they just weren't popular. He couldn't, you know, people, one of those little guys, which they were getting, uh, they were going to foreign markets. So Monterey Sardines go to foreign countries. That's where they were going. Also around the turn of the 20th century, the French sardine market began to dry up. It began to collapse. And this is an ad from a French uh, magazine that appeared about sardines, uh, French sardines. I love what it says. it says. Since the failure of the catch of sardines on the French coast, it was collapsing. An enormous quantity of foreign fish coming from bottom, coming from California, coming from Monterey, uh, has been imported in France and fraudulently labeled French. Of course, they were canning sardines. They were cooking them in what they called the French method. They were being cooked in hot oil, peanut oil or olive oil. It's uh, where French fries come from. That's the whole idea. That's how they were selling these sardines in Europe as the French method of sardine right there. So Booth sent for these uh, Sicilian fishermen. Here is one of those proud Sicilian fisherman on his brand new sardine boat, what he called a Lampara boat, which refers to a type of bedding what he used, with his three beautiful daughters, you see right here, all on the, you know, standing or near the boat right here. This is right on the, the here, the wharf you see right here is actually what's about where wharf number two is today. It was the railroad wharf, railroad wharf at that time. It was also known as the Japanese wharf because Japanese fishermen would fish off that wharf at that time. Uh, and then here is a wonderful photograph of early Sicilian fishermen fishing sardine right in the middle of the Monterey Harbor. You see it right here. You can see Seaside behind us right over, right over here. And you can see all these uh, Sicilian fishermen right here. Uh, this is a guy right here named Piatto Ferrante who's responsible for all these Sicilian fishermen coming here to Monterey. You can see the net full of fish. Now the net operated, it had lead weights on the bottom. It had glass floats on the top. Well, a good captain like Pietro Ferrantier knows that if you take care of your crew, your crew will take care of you. And this is what he would use to float his nets. This is one of those glass floats. Of course, it's a bottle. And if you look closely, you notice it's got a rounded bottom on it. In those days, you put a, because of the, because of the way the, the glass was made, you put a, a, a carbonate, carbonated beverage in the bottle and it's upright. The carbonation would pop the cork but it's on its side, it wouldn't do that. So you use these bottles, he'd fill the bottles with beer, use them to float his nets in the cold water of Monterey Bay, the dentition, they pull off the floats, everybody had cold beer. Pretty smart, I like to think. 
So here's some Sicilian system unloading sardines right at the Monterey Wharf. This was about 1910. Again, this is mainly going to a foreign market. That's what the market was. It wasn't a big local market. There wasn't a big uh, domestic market for it. This is uh, what this is not. This is a not the boat action. This is a barge they pull behind them called a lighter, uh, and it, this this is a small one. This could maybe hold 15 tons of sardine in it uh, coming in to unload there at the wharf. So what happens? Well, a couple of things happened to make that fish become the largest fishery, single fish in the history of the United States. One of them was in 1915, San Francisco held the World's Fair. World's Fair were very special things in those days. Uh, this was the Panama Pacific International Exposition, which was a World's Fair. They opened to honor the opening of the Panama Canal that opened a couple of years before. And San Francisco was awarded this this World's Fair because it was still sort of crawling out of that 1906 earthquake and fire. And, and so they built this World's Fair. And if you know San Francisco, the Palace of Fine Arts was built for that World's Fair. In fact, the whole area there uh, was actually a big mud, big mud flat. It was all filled in for this World's Fair. Here is the World's Fair at San Francisco, the Panama Pacific 1915 World's Fair. Uh, it was a very special thing. Every state was represented. There were many, many countries represented at this World's Fair. Uh, all kinds of new products were introduced. Cars were kind of being built at the World's Fair there. Uh, uh, it, it was only lasted for about a year when it, and when it operated. Um, California, state of California, because it was in California, right, had the largest of the state buildings, almost five acres in size. Uh, inside the California State Building, every county was represented. Here's our ticket. Let's go visit the Monterey, uh, Monterey exhibits at the, in the California building at the Panama Pacific. Monterey County had one of the biggest exhibits actually at, uh, at that World's Fair. So here's a photograph of the Monterey County World's uh, exhibit at the World's Fair here. Let's see if I can zoom in here. Here you can see, here's one of my favorite things. It's this beautiful oak chair. This is made out of, out of, out of the oak. That supposedly that uh, in 1602 that Sebastian Vizcaino held mass under when they first arrived on the shores of Monterey Bay. Then almost 200 years later, supposedly under that same oak tree, uh, Winifred Sara held mass under uh, uh, under that same oak tree. Well, that oak tree died in 1905. I won't go into the whole history of that oak tree here, but. Uh, it needs to say it, it did die, and, and uh, parts of it actually you can still see at the San Carlos Cathedral. But a guy by the name of Harry Green, actually, who was a lover of trees and all kinds of different things, uh, uh, he actually took some of the loose branches from that tree and had a Japanese uh, fisherman, a guy by the name of Ichiro Noda, make this chair. In fact, he made three of these chairs. Two of them are missing and have been missing for many, many years. You don't know what happened to them. But this one you see right here, you can actually see, I'm proud to say, is on exhibit today at the Japanese American Sister League uh, Heritage Center Museum. I uh, have it on exhibit there. It actually belongs to California State Parks. We have it on loan to us right there. But this is part of that exhibit. Uh, at the Panama Pacific, here's a model of the of the uh, Carmel Mission, and there's a model of Colton or of the Custom House. You see right there. Here's another part of that exhibit. Uh, you can see right here's one of my favorite things. You see because they're promoting all kinds of things in the Monterey Bay, particularly abalone. You see all the abalone shells. You see right here. And look, an abalone diver in the case. You see right there. Uh, and all right here, you can see him in all dressed in his in his abalone suit, in his heavy helmet, and you can see the abalone basket here and the big heavy lead weights he would wear. And then here's all of the abalone. This is canned abalone, actually, you see, or in the case you see right here. And then here's the back side of it. And anybody remembers the old Pacifico Museum of Natural History? I remember as a kid, when you went into the museum in the main room, they had this big exhibit uh, that was sort of underwater of uh, uh, Monterey Bay, and this is it. That exhibit that the Zero Museum Natural History had came from the Panama Pacific that Monterey County made for the World's Fair. And there it is, and you can see our diver right there. So here's the cool thing. Here is a business card 
that I found once many years ago on eBay for the Booth Sardine Company. And I first saw it on eBay. eBay, by the way, was, was the museum curator's best friend. But you find all kinds of things. And I saw the business card. I'd never seen one before. I said, oh, business card. But I was really disappointed because I could see that someone had written on it. But I had never seen it before, so I bid on it, and I actually won that card and, and got it, and, and, and I actually paid like forty dollars for it. And that was like twenty some years ago. But when I got the card, I was really happy. You looked down, you, I could read what it said. It says near U.S. Fisheries Food Products Building Exposition. This is from the Panama Pacific World's Fair. So probably some guy had a had a grocery store back there in Missouri. He was visiting the World's Fair because they were selling Monterey sardines, Booth sardines, at that World's Fair. Booth was highly visible and represented at that World's Fair. Here is inside that food products building. And look, if we look closely right here, you can see right there, there's Booth sardines. And there's a case of it right here. Uh, they were being marketed and sold at that World's Fair, introduced to the world at this World's Fair, because the only kind of sardines people could get, and people wanted sardines. They loved eating their sardines, as I mentioned, uh, but they, they couldn't get their little guy because in 1914, what happened to the world? World War I. It cuts off all that uh, salmon going to Europe and all those sardines coming from Europe, and they just switch begin to heavily fish sardine along the West Coast. The worst sardine canners in New York State and Maine, those guys couldn't fish because they were German submarines out there in the Atlantic. And so they began to heavily fish sardine in Monterey Bay and along the entire West Coast right here. By the way, this photograph was actually taken inside the Foods Product Building uh, in 1915. Uh, but what this was, there was a couple that got married during the World's Fair, and it was sort of a publicity stunt. And all the businesses gave the couple all these different products for their wedding as a wedding gift, including uh, Booth sardines. Well, there you go. What a great gift that was. So that really helped the Monterey sardine fishery become that big, uh, the big fishery that eventually grows into. Oh, really helped push it. As I mentioned, World War I breaks out and it cuts off all of those sardines coming from Europe and a big demand for them. So here's an ad for the Booth sardines that appears about 1918. In peace or war, Booth sardine. So during the war, there was a, so before the war, before the war, the, uh, the boat owners, the captains uh, would negotiate with the carry owners for prices for their fish every year. They negotiate for prices per ton. Uh, and then it became kind of an annual event for these boat owners to go out on strike every year. Uh, uh, but during the war, they couldn't go out on strike because the, uh, the Food Administration, part of the United States government, they controlled the prices of the fish. They told them how much they were going to get. Although they were very upset, uh, the boat owners wanted to go out on strike. They didn't think they're getting enough money uh, for their sardines. So a strike of sardine fishermen will be nipped in the bud uh, by the federal government. But as I mentioned, it became kind of an annual event for these boat owners to go out on strike. They were, uh, they were unionized from the jump from the very beginning, unlike their crew members, or unlike those cannery, cannery workers. Like the cannery workers did not get unionized until 1938. Uh, but the boat owners, they're unionized from the beginning. But the crew members, if you are a crewman and your boat owners are out on strike, then you're not fishing. If you're not fishing, you're not making any money. You're not making any money. Uh, you can't pay your rent. You can't feed your family. So after a particularly long strike in 1925, all these crewmen said, form their own union. In fact, on November 27, 1925, they formed the Monterey Fishers Protective Union. Uh, on November 28, 1925, they're all fired by the boat owners for forming this union. We don't need you, they said. We're going to bring in these big boats. We don't need as many fishermen. And Newt Holden, Holden Cannery said, I'll just send out my cannery workers. Anybody, anybody go in that bay and fish sardines. Well, after six weeks of seasick cannery workers, those crewmen had their own union. And here is a wonderful banner from that union, uh, the Monterey Fisher Protective Union. But they used to carry this in all the 4th of July parade and the Santa Rosalia parade uh, every year. It's beautiful. And I used to have this hanging at the Maritime Museum. Uh, it, uh, it was a, one of my favorite artifacts that we had right there. So here's a, so 
as I mentioned, uh, these guys are very upset. In 1918, they couldn't go on strike. So it was a prompt action on part of the civil and military authorities settled the strike of the starting fishermen Saturday night. A detachment of soldiers from the Presidio was stationed at the wharf all night to see that there was no trouble in carrying out the orders of the food administration. As a result, every fishing crew but one went out that night. That single exception was a crew that was two men short. So everybody fished. They accepted that price for that 1918 sardine season. But it wasn't just the war that affected those canneries. This seems familiar, doesn't it? Influenza vaccine given to cannery employees. So yes, in 1918, as we probably all know, there was a, a worldwide pandemic going on and they had to uh, vaccinate all these cannery workers at A.M. Allen, uh, who uh, A.M. Allen, who owned Point Lobos, actually had the Monterey Cannon Company down there on Cannery Row, and he vaccinated his employees. It says that Dr. Little, oh, Dr. Lilly, was fortunate enough to have a, a hand, a small quantity of influenza vaccine, and has been administering it to the employees of the Allen Cannery, in which he is interested in, as he believes that the industry must be kept going, that this is a good way to assist it. And of course, it wasn't just sardines needed for the food and for the war effort, because they were sending these sardines also uh, to the soldiers. It says, girls and women wanted at Kay Hogan's cannery to string beans, apply at once. So Newt Hogan actually had, his, uh, had, uh, had farmland out there in the Salinas Valley, uh, growing mostly tomatoes, but he evidently also grew string beans out there and they did can them. Uh, uh, the cannery, they also had a cannery in San Diego at one point they were canning asparagus and things like that as well. Uh, here's a photograph, it's not a great photograph. Uh, I took this off of a newspaper, but this is uh, uh, so a few, uh, this is a photograph of the items that were, that the Red Cross would deliver to to American prisoners of war being held in, in uh, prison in Europe. And if you look closely here, we can see here's our canned fish products right here. They were sending sardines and there it is. That's the same canned product you see in that picture. Sea fried pilchards. This was, uh, uh, so those canneries were mostly from Monterey uh, going all the way to Europe. Uh, uh, and uh, Sea Pride, by the way, was a Japanese-owned cannery. In fact, it was the only totally, completely Japanese-owned cannery that was owned by the Oda family. Uh, their cannery is located uh, uh, where the Maui Aquarium has this big uh, open water exhibit, so that second wing, where that's where their cannery was uh, up there. And if you go across the street where their warehouse was, but that building is still there. I believe there's a crepe place in there today. Uh, but if you look at that building and then go to Monterey and look at the Gay Seal Hall on Adam Street, you'll notice the buildings look exactly the same uh, because they were built by the same builders, uh, uh, Japanese builders that you see right there. So, so the fishery, uh, so the Monterey sardines really sold as a food item. The best time it sold really was during the war years, because it's all anybody could get was those big, larger sardines. But people just thought they were too big and too oily. But once that war ended in 1919, uh, and, and the fisheries in the Atlantic side of the world could reopen, uh, then and they could get those smaller sardines, uh, well, then they stopped buying the California Monterey sardines. And all the sardine canneries were in big trouble. But they learned, these processors learned early on that these big sardines produced a lot of fish meal and a lot of oil. And the real money never was in the canned product, but the real money was always in the byproducts. This is a label from the Booth Sardine Cannery for its chicken feed. And uh, this is increases egg production, improves shell texture, increases hatchability, increases vitamin D content of eggs. Uh, uh, the chicken industry did very well because of the Monterey sardine fishery. The next time you guys all go to the market and buy yourself a chicken for dinner, you can thank the Monterey sardine for that chicken. Because prior to 1920, the chicken industry in California was not doing very well. People did not eat chicken like we do today. It was kind of expensive. We began to produce this cheap chicken feed out of the head, tails, and offal, the Monterey sardine. The chickens loved it. 
thrived on it. More and more chickens are being produced. The price of chicken went down. People began to buy chickens. My friend Bill Ripley, who was a retired biologist for the California Department of Fish and Game, used to say that foster farm chicken owes its life to the bones of the Monterey sardine. Absolutely true. And this is one of those labels that they would put on those bags of chicken feed out there. So during the Depression, Monterey sardines were people, besides chicken feed, people were buying California sardines because they were a cheap food source. They were very cheap. You could buy a can of sardines for a nickel. Uh, uh, but they're all, and they're also really good for you, actually. Uh, but as the war in Europe during World War II, as things began to develop uh, in, in Europe and also in Asia, as Japan begins to show its might, uh, there was a lot of unease along the West Coast here and also in the, in the United States. This is my friend Roy Hitori. And in the late 1930s, there was a lot of concern coming from the, from the federal government uh, about Japan, and they were convinced that Japanese were may attack, uh, set a, a fleet to attack the West Coast. And, and Roy, who was an only diver, had his own boat. And he used to get his charts from the Coast Guard. And, and he said one time that the, uh, the FBI came to visit him on his boat one, one day because they were concerned about those charts that he had. And they wanted to know where he got them. He said, well, I caught these charts uh, from the Coast Guard. Where do you go get them? So they were very concerned about that kind of thing. And, and, there, and uh, they really began to follow the Japanese. In fact, they asked Roy if he would be willing to be a spy uh, for the federal government uh, and spy on his fellow Japanese fishermen, uh, convinced that they were going out into the water, out into the bay, and they were meeting Japanese uh, submarines and that kind of thing. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. There's nobody out there. No, what he's doing, that kind of thing. Eventually, Roy, by the way, uh, eventually does get drafted into the army because part of the military intelligence service. He goes off to, uh, he's sent to Hiroshima uh, about a week after the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and, and, and work with doctors over there and, and did all kinds of, of really important work over there. Uh, so when World War II does finally break out, of course, Monterey is very, plays a big role in that. Here is a label for, no, it's not sardines, it's for mackerel. But yes, it's a, a, it is typical label uh, from during World War II. Of course, you see the big battleship right there. This is a Monterey label, Sea Pride Cannery that you see here. This is not the same Sea Pride Cannery that the Oda family owned. They sold it by then. Uh, but it's in the same building that you see right there. Uh, but but uh, very typical uh, kind of war during the war years. So, so because of the war, of course, men are drafted, sent off to war. You had to put it, do your war effort. So workers were needed. Uh, you know, the sardines were needed in the, in the canneries. They needed workers for sure. You'd see these posters all over town, all over the Monterey Peninsula. These are men overseas, work in a cannery, whole time, part time. And sign up today. Nice employment office. This is sponsored by the Monterey Peninsula Victory Food Committee, which was actually made up of a number of uh, food processors. And uh, they used to do radio shows and and they would bring high school kids in and, and uh, to go in and work in the canneries. It was, you know, it was considered to be your patriotic duty to go in and work in the canneries. Actually, during the war, uh, there were a, a small group of Italian prisoners of war that were captured in Europe and they were brought to the United States and they had a small prison camp uh, in Fort Ord for these guys. And these number of these guys actually were sent in to work in the Monterey starting canneries, these Italian prisoners of war. I actually interviewed a woman, a Sicilian woman, who met her husband, who was an Italian prisoner of war, uh, who came to work in the cannery. She worked in the cannery as well, and they met while, uh, while working in the canneries during World War II. Sounds like some kind of Italian opera. Anyway, so, so while the reason, of course, they also, a lot of the workforce in those canneries uh, were Asian. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the workers were Japanese, not just men, but whole families would work in those canneries. Of course, we know what happened to the Japanese communities. Uh, this is a this is a union book. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, unions came into the starting canneries in, uh, in 1938, uh, AFL. They came in and American Federation of Labor and began to unionize all these workers. Uh, this is a union book for uh, Mr. Sato, Japanese worker, 
And, and, and let's get a close over here. You can see here is his work. This is his U book, union book from 1941. And of course, how it operates union, you would pay your dues every once a month, and then it would be stamped and signed by the union secretary who would do, who, who signed it. In fact, my grandmother uh, was the secretary to the union at one time, and I've seen some of these books with her signature in it. This is not one of them, uh, but the number represents the the, uh, the uh, secretary of the union there. But he would every month you'd get that sign, get that stamp, and you can see go down here, February twenty seventh, nineteen forty one. He withdraws from the union because he was drafted into the army, along with a number of other young Japanese boys were drafted that spring. This is before World War II starts, but the United States, you know, they see what's gonna happen. And so they, and they are drafting a lot of young men at that time. And Mr. Sato actually eventually goes on and, and becomes part of the 442nd, which is the most highly decorated uh, military unit in American history. Uh, uh, and he is in the, he spends his whole time in the United States Army in Europe. And if you look at this wonderful little book, which tells a huge story, he withdraws in 1941, but he comes back to Monterey and look, it's come back again, October 26, 1945. He goes back to work in the cameras after serving all that time in the army, fighting in Europe for the 442nd. He comes back, goes right back to work in the cannery. They really needed workers at that time. So when, when the war ended, though, these workers were welcomed back. Uh, there was some letters written to the local newspapers about bringing them back, but they were welcomed back into the canneries because they really needed them to come back to work there. So here is an ad for the Monterey Herald. 500 more women needed to sign up for cannery work. I love this part. Volunteers to pack food for fighting men. You could volunteer your time canning fish. Again, it was your patriotic duty to do that, to work in those canneries. Uh, so Maria Coran, which of course sits on the side of the old Hoveden cannery, has a large volunteer uh, uh, group of folks over there. That was the first time you could have volunteered at Hoveden cannery canning sardines at that time. So I, that was really a, a big deal. And as I mentioned, they, they actually brought in high school workers and they really pushed high school kids to come in and work in those calories uh, because they, they, were, they, they, you know, they were 15, 16 years old. They're out there canning fish and stuff. Uh, I mean, how many 15 or 16 year old kids do you think today were going to do that kind of work? Uh, but it was hard, hard work doing that kind of stuff right there. So Canary Line is Monterey Peninsula's home front battle line. Uh, I, I love that. So this is another picture I pulled out of the newspaper of them working these these women volunteering their time to can fish in the canneries right there for the for the war effort. And they were sending sardines to the soldiers uh, a, 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 onto the home front. Uh, Canners appeal. This is just to tell again. Uh, the War Production Board uh, uh, was set up during World War II, and they're the ones who set the prices uh, for the sardines uh, that the fishermen were going to get every year. But not only did they set the prices for the sardine that the sardines get, they're also setting the prices that the cannery owners were going to be able to pay out, uh, which controlled the prices that the cannery workers were going to get paid uh, in those canneries right there. And not only did they do that, but but typically before the war, uh, a, a, a boat owner would uh, contract to a particular cannery every season and you would fish for that particular cannery every season. That's what you would do. You would, you, you would sign up for the Hoveden cannery or, or the Del Mar cannery and you were gonna fish for that cannery all season. But during the war, no, that didn't happen. So the War Production Board actually, uh, the actually put a man at the end of the breakwater in Monterey in a booth right there. And when the boats would come in, you fish sardine at night, right? And you would come in at three, four, five o'clock in the morning, and you had to go to that booth at the, at the uh, end of the breakwater. And then that man would then look on his list, and he would tell you what cannery you're going to go to unload your fish at. And oftentimes it wasn't in Monterey. Oftentimes they tell these guys you had to take your fish up to a cannery in San Francisco. I've been fishing all night, right? And then you have to turn around and go all the way up to San Francisco. It's gonna take you four or five hours to do that, to unload all your fish. So it was tough doing that. Of course, a lot of the Monterey fishermen uh, when the when the World War II started, uh, the United States government came in. And actually, the Monterey military really came in and took all their boats and actually used them 
uh, converted them to to use for the war effort. They turned them into gunboats, different things like that. Then they realized they needed these guys to fish sardine. And so these guys had to come back and had to lease boats because they couldn't get their old boat back and to lease other boats so they could go out and fish sardine. So finally, fishing fishing agreement is completed uh, and for 42, 43 season. Uh, I think they got $22. $22 sardine price, which actually was pretty good money in 1942 and 43. That's $22 a ton that these guys are getting paid uh, to do that. So another nice product, uh, I put this in the can. This is uh, what's called an ACE or Armed Service Edition. During the war, the uh, uh, all the uh, publishing companies got together and they wanted to do help out and they help out the war effort. And they began to produce these books. They produced hundreds of these novels and books that were just produced for the soldiers out on the out on the battlefields. And these were designs that fit in the pocket of a field jacket. Uh, and so uh, that's what uh, they're called Armed Service Editions. Uh, uh, and of course, this is Cannery Row, which was published uh, in January of 1945. So it's actually published towards the end of World War II, but they still published this out as an ASC and and, uh, and and sent it out to all those soldiers out there, out in the mainly out in the Pacific, you know, reading the book Cannery Row. They actually produced hundreds of these books out there, and you can actually find this still on eBay and things like that. So, so here is uh, Jacques Pipin, the famous French chef. Uh, I love Jacques Pipin. I admit, I love to watch cooking shows. And he was one of my favorites. I still watch. He puts on these little neat little five minute little uh, Facebook things and he's cooking out of his kitchen at home. And I actually learned a lot from him uh, doing that. But I read this book he wrote about hibography of him growing up. Of course, he's French, grew up in France. And when the war started, uh, his mother had sent he and his brother into the country uh, to get out of the city. And, and they grew up in the countryside of France. And he said during the war, the, uh, the United States Army, the United States Air Force, would send in supplies for the French resistance. I'd fly them in and drop them in uh, by parachute, big crates, wooden crates of different kinds of food products and clothing and things like that. And so whenever they'd see these things dropped down into the field, he and his brother would run to get those, see what they could find inside those crates. And so they found cans and cans of sardines inside those wooden crates. And he said, because of that, he and his brother fell in love with eating sardines. But what Jacques doesn't know is those sardines he was eating were coming from the Monterey canneries right here. All right. So I put this in here. So when the fishery does collapse in the 1950s and the canneries, uh, Canterbury really does change. Uh, in fact, there was a guy in San Francisco uh, uh, who wanted to turn um, Canterbury can into a big, uh, fancy resort area uh, and all kinds of things. That never happened. And Neil the Bonds restaurant. Uh, was uh, a big part of that. Uh, anybody, anybody who grew up in Monterey members Neil DeVon's restaurant opening in the 1950s. It was famous for its green turtle soup. And a lot of kids had their proms at the Neil DeVon's restaurant that was the first big restaurant on Canada after the sodium fishery collapses. But I want to cut this a little short. As I mentioned, this show today is a tribute to my friend, uh, Jerry Losovato. I met Jerry about 25 years ago when she wandered into my office at the Maritime Museum, and she wanted to know everything she'd find out about the Chinese in the Monterey area, and especially about her family. Of course, she is Chinese, and her great-great-grandmother was a, a woman by the name of Kwok Moy. And Kwok Moy was, we believe, the first Chinese-American born in California, especially, particularly, uh, we know for sure, in Monterey. And uh, Kwok Moy could speak five different languages. She could speak Chinese, she could speak English, she could speak uh, Portuguese, she could speak Spanish, and she could speak Wonsin, which was the native language, the Indian language of Monterey. And she also worked in the cannery, Kwok Moy did. And she had been out, Jerry had been out to Point Lobos and saw a little exhibit about her, her relative. And so she wanted to learn everything she could. And so the last 25 years, she's been pushing that story about her family, in, in Monterey, being the first real fisherman in Monterey. And this, I love this photograph of her at Point Lobos. And this is she holding this lantern because she has really worked on a film 
uh, I was part of this film as well, that a group of CSUMB students put together called By the Light of the Lanterns about these early Chinese fishermen, about her family uh, who came to Monterey in the early 1850s who began to fish squid at night using lanterns and uh, introduced the squid fishery in California, which today is the largest fishery economically in California, all because of Jar Jerry's family that did all of that. So what we thought we'd do today is in this program today, I want to show you, uh, we last, just a couple months ago, uh, we have our annual history slam. In fact, it was in April, we had our second annual history slam. It's a little 15 minute presentations uh, that people, different historians give out about history. And Jerry gave a, was part of a program there. And I want to show that uh, in tribute to my friend, uh, uh, Jerry Losabano. So John, I need to get out of my thing, right? Yes, and I'll start the video. Okay, so I need to do that. And how do I do that? Hang on. Uh, I got it for you. You got it? All right. Yep. Here's now here's the video. All right. Thank you. All right. Up next we have Donald Coors and Jerry Lo Sabado. The presentation is Pacific Grove's Chinese Fishing Village Legacy, Connections to John Steinbeck, Ed Ricketts, and America. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Now I just have to get the presentation going and we'll see how we go here. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, title of the talk is Pacific Coast Chinese Fishing Village Connections. It's John Steinbeck and look at in America. I'm Don Coors, and I'm here with Jerry Los Sabado, fifth generation Chinese fishing descendant. And we're going to talk about the Chinese fishing village that was established approximately about in the early 1850s. And as we've been hearing all day, um, lasted until 1906. And John Steinbeck's family who owned um, a summer cottage in Pacific Grove. Steinbeck grew up a good bit of time in Pacific Grove. And here we have a quote from him from the Monterey Peninsula Herald in 18, 1957. I remember it well. Shacks built of scraps of wood, mats, pieces of tin, the district known as Chinatown, a street of sewage disposal and very romantic. Steinbeck goes on and tells us from a letter to Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Jackson in 1948, Mary and I used to, Mary and I used, used to watch them dig up the skeletons and we stole the punks and the papers and the flowers off the new graves too. I used to like that graveyard. It was so rocky that some of the bodies had to be slipped in almost horizontally under the big rocks. He goes on. We find this John Steinbeck's cannery row where Lee Chong dug into the grave of the on China Point and found the yellow bones, the skull with gray ropey hair still sticking to it. And Lee carefully packed the bones, femurs and tibias really straight, skull in the middle with the pelvis and the clavicle shrouded it and ribs curving on either side. Then Lee Chong sent his boxed and brilled grandfather over the Western Sea to lie at the last, at last in the ground made holy by his ancestors. And you can find more information regarding this Chinese burial practice by Sandy Lydon's article, The Bone Pickers, Appeasing the Hungry Ghosts. And Steinbeck mentions the Chinese fishing village fire of 1906. He says, I remember the night the whole thing burnt to the ground. We felt that a way of life was gone forever. Well, here's a picture of Tuck of Kwok Tuck Lee, a great Chinese fisherman who lived at the Chinese fishing village with his wife and his children. And we have a little bit more information from the San Francisco Evening Bulletin in 1888 that tells us about Tuck Lee the only Chinese voter in Monterey County will cast his first vote in November for Cleveland and Thurman. Tuck was born in Monterey and follows fishing for a living. He is bright and clean and 
can speak English and Spanish. So what did Tuck Lee fish for? Practically everything. And he collected specimens for the scientists at Hopkins Seaside Laboratory. And what did he collect? He collected hagfish, as we find out from Holder and Jordan. Hagfish, they were hated of the fishermen until Pacific Grove was made the seat of a scientist of a scientific station, that being Hopkins Seaside Laboratory, and scientific man as George Clinton Price, Franz Dauphine, Howard Eyre, and Baffert Dean, ready to pay more for these slimy, repulsive creatures than any good fish are worth. Now, the pursuit of hagfish in Pacific Grove has become something of an industry of itself. And here we have Baffert Dean, the American zoologist, specializing in ichthyology, who visited Hopkins Seaside Laboratory during the summers of 1896 and 1899. He hired Tuck Lee to collect these hagfish embryos. And here we have a picture of those hagfish embryos that Tuck Lee had gathered for Bashford Dean. And Bashford wrote in that article in that scientific publication, the collection of hagfish eggs has been due to the labor of, of, of a particularly a single fisherman, Ah Tuck Lee, who was energetic help is thus almost a sin qua non. According to the dictionary, the definition sin qua non is as being something almost indispensable or essential. And Ray Lyman Wilbur, the third president of Stanford University, the university chancellor, 31st United States Secretary of the Interior, he knew Tuck Lee, he writes, in my collecting work for the Hopkins Seaside Laboratory, one of my best friends was Ah Tuck, a Chinese fisherman near Monterey. And then we have Ed Ricketts, Pacific Biological Laboratories. Ed Ricketts has these collecting survey cards for Alaska, Monterey, Southern California, Baja, California. And on these cards, he mentions the date who collected for him these particular specimens and who identified them. This particular specimen was identified by Walter K. Fisher. But then we find many specimens, cards, with mentioning the name Chin Yip. And as we see in this one, it was identified by Henry Bigelow. Numerous Pacific Biological Laboratory survey cards mention Chin Yip and identify the many specimens he collected for Ricketts. In her recollections, Nan Rickett tells us how indispensable Chin Yip was to Ed and how they befriended the Youngs every Christmas. One of our most dependable shark collectors was Chin Yip, a Chinese fisherman. He wanted to be paid once a year and only the week of the Chinese New Year. We understood that according to their religion, all debts were to be paid before the New Year. On the day of our family was invited to the house to partake on their specially prepared food and drink their liquor, which was pretty potent. And what about Chin, uh, Chin Yip? Chin Yip was born 1881 in Pacific Grove, Chinese fishing village. Uh, Chin Yip and his family were forced to move to Maccabee Beach in 1906 after the devastating fire. Yip. Then an American citizen was able to purchase the lot at 774 Wave Street. And, and we now have to hypothesize that Chin Yip was quite possibly served as a character for the Chinaman in Steinbeck's Cannery Row. Okay, so further uh, discussions about this whole group of people, Tuck Lee, Chin Yip, Kwok Moy, we are going to turn over now to Jerry Lo Sabado. Jerry Lowell, would you like to take control? Yes, thank you. Uh, and Chin Yip was my grandfather, my mother's father. And um, that house that we just saw uh, above the Wave Street Studios, that was my, uh, that was grandpa's house and grandma's house where we had our, uh, all our family parties. Um, so, um, my generation grew up really not knowing this history at all. And uh, Don has really found a lot of information about our family that I didn't know about. And um, so growing up, like I said, we didn't know. But when I did learn uh, about our history, bits and pieces, uh, I began to uh, 
tried to get organizations, uh, for instance, the PG Museum of Natural History, to talk about that history in Pacific Grove. So this is an early exhibit um, that shows uh, uh, the the um, these are the the fishing villages. Uh, this one is the uh, Point Almeas. Point Alonis fishing village, and this is the Maccabee Beach uh, fishing village. Uh, these were built by Michael Croft. Uh, they're excellent, uh, uh, very, very uh, detailed um, replicas of the village. And this picture right here of the two girls, um, it turns out the museum didn't know it, uh, and I didn't know that they had uh, the picture. Um, these two girls are my great aunts. They're my grandfather's sisters. This is Samgu and Minnie. And um, this is a picture actually of my great grandfather's house. This is uh, Tuck Lee's house uh, at Point Almea. So this is the point where Hopkins Marine Station is. Around the cove on the other side is uh, Point Al Alonis, which is where the aquarium is. And I believe that these two people could uh, are my great grandparents. Um, in 2010, we were lucky enough to have uh, Mayor Carmelita Garcia and the city council support uh, an idea to have a walk of remembrance. And um, uh, at that walk of remembrance, descendants came. This is my sister, Marjorie, my auntie, uh, Pearl. Um, she, we lost her last year at 105 years old. This is um, a cousin, um, Fred, uh, and uh, he's 100 this year. Here's Auntie Pearl again, and uh, it was such an auspicious occasion to have the lions uh, come and perform for us. Uh, while I was growing up on the Monterey Peninsula, I was born and raised there. I never saw a Chinese lion, so this was very special to me. And uh, these are uh, the lions uh, leading the, the Walk of Remembrance uh, to the site where the Chinese village uh, once stood, where Hopkins Marine Station now stands. And um, this was in 2014 when we um, unveiled a boulder with a plaque dedicated to the uh, early Chinese fishermen um, telling the history about the Chinese who once lived just behind us and on this occasion, we had many dignitaries, the mayor of Pacific Grove, Mayor Camp, uh, Mark Stone, the assemblyman, uh, Sam Farr, the uh, senator, and um, uh, Annie Holdren. She wrote the text for the plaque. And uh, Janet Colhan, a friend who without her, this would not have been possible. And Jeff Norman, who designed this plaque. And um, on the plaque is a wonderful picture of that Chinese village and the inset uh, picture of my great grandfather, uh, Kwok Tuk Lee. And then here's a picture of uh, um, the Walk of Remembrance uh, in 2018. We were able to go onto the premises at Hopkins Marine Station and the Monterey Bay Lion Dance team uh, led the way. And these are uh, descendants and friends of, uh, of the descendants. Um, we have uh, here sixth, fifth generation, sixth generation and seventh generation uh, village descendants. And then this was uh, the 10th Walk of Remembrance. Um, it was a, a wonderful event uh, visited by many people. Up here is Davis Chin. He, uh, at that time, was the president of the National Chinese American Citizen Alliance. 
and uh, Jean Kwan and Floyd uh, Huan from the uh, Chinese American Citizen Alliance, uh, and um, Palma Yu from the um, San Francisco uh, Chinese Historical Society, uh, and then uh, Mibs McCarthy from the ACLU. But I have uh, many people, here's my sister again, uh, and another uh, descendant, Peggy Benitez, who um, I, I've only met in the last uh, few years. Uh, other descendants have been uh, reaching out to me, and uh, sometimes it feels as though I'm putting the village back together again. Um, and so uh, this was a great, uh, the 10th year of our Walk of Remembrance. Uh, again, here are the um, fifth, sixth, and seventh generation descendants on the site at Hopkins Marine Station. And again, other uh, allies um, who have helped me uh, through the years to uh, tell that story. Again, different allies again. Uh, but we set up this uh, table to bring um, pieces of memories of um, things that are important to our Chinese culture uh, and to remember our ancestors who once lived there and thrived there. Uh, this is the Wave Street Studios. Um, the studio is back here, the studio cafe. And up here is the house where um, that my grandparents and uh, my mother and her siblings lived in. Uh, the house was lifted up and the studio was uh, built underneath it and then the house put back on top of it. And here we are inside with Rhett Smith, the owner, and here's a, a photo of Kwok Moy, my great grandmother. She's the first documented Chinese female born in the Monterey Peninsula. She was born in Point Lobos in 1859. And outside on the recreation trail, there is a plaque uh, dedicated to Kwok Moy. Um, and she spoke five languages. And I feel that she was a, a communicator and a friend of many cultures. Uh, this is a picture of uh, my, my father's family's uh, fish market. At this time, uh, rather than being the fishermen, now we were the um, commercial fishermen. Uh, and we had uh, Italian fishermen who fished for us. And um, we had Japanese workers uh, um, uh, who were our, our general manager. And um, the late Japanese ladies worked with my mother to fillet the fish. And um, I have a picture that didn't go in. I'm going to try to show it to you in front of the uh, screen. This is my father, Ed Lowe, and then uh, my uncle, Alfred Jung, and my uncle, Howard Lowe. He was the boss, the big brother. And um, we were the West Coast buyers for Star Kiss Tuna, and we sold fish to many of the restaurants, to the country club. We sold fish to uh, Fort Ord, we helped to sustain our soldiers. This is a picture of my auntie. Now, in light of what's been happening uh, across the country today with the anti-Asian racism, I felt it's important to tell a, 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 a bigger story of our family. And I wanted to show this picture of auntie who was a staff leader and then a staff sergeant uh, she was um, worked in the uh, the mess hall, and um, she was one of the she was the first Chinese uh, whack to join from the San Francisco um, recruiting office. And um, here is a picture of my father. He was a signalman, second class in the Navy, uh, and uh, he received the Philippine Liberation. Uh, ribbon. In fact, uh, Auntie uh, Bertha, she received the um, the Good Conduct Medal, the World War II Victory Medal, the American Campaign Medal, and the WAC Service Medal. Hey, Jerry. So, Jerry, 
we're, oh. we're getting close on time. Okay. I just wanted um, to let you know. Just so, just so you know, I um, applied for them to receive the Congressional Gold Medal that is being given to um, the Chinese American World War II veterans. And I just wanted to highlight uh, them. This is my father and mother because our family has been on the Monterey Peninsula a long time. And I believe that um, uh, our, their story needs to be told now so that people understand that we are Americans and um, the treatment that's happening across the country now needs us to stand up and speak out against the, the anti-Asian uh, and Pacific Islander uh, racism. This is a picture of uh, my sisters and I on Cannery Road because this area in Monterey is the area that we uh, hung out uh, a lot at. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. Greatly appreciate it. Very good. So Jerry was an, a friend I knew her for a long time. It's fine and nice to hear all that stuff again. I, I, he actually became my teacher, so. Thank you, Tim. And um, at this time, if anyone has any questions for Tim, um, Please feel free to unmute yourself or type it into the chat um, and we can ask Tim the questions. Um, so some comments can come in, Tim. Thanks for recognizing Jerry. He was a yes. lovely person and good friend. Great tribute to Jerry, very informative. Good. All right. Well, there's no questions. Um, just want to say thank you, Tim, for the presentation. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we will be back here um, next Thursday with another Cannery Rose Day celebration. Uh, we'll have uh, Professor Susan Schillinglaw talking about Sweet Thursday. She's a she's studied a lot of Steinbeck, and she uh, teaches at the University San Jose State University, and she'll be talking about Sweet Thursday and the rewriting of Doc Ricketts throughout Steinbeck's novels. So if you guys are interested, please feel free to register on the library's uh, event page. And thank you all for coming and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.